Introduction. What this book expects to accomplish. The purpose of this book is to supply, in a form suitable for laymen, guidance in the adoption and execution of an investment policy. Comparatively little will be said here about the technique of analyzing securities. Attention will be paid chiefly to the investment principles and investors' attitudes. We shall, however, provide a number of condensed comparisons of specific securities, chiefly in pairs appearing side by side in the New York Stock Exchange list. In order to bring home in concrete fashion the important elements involved in specific choices of common stocks. But much of our space will be devoted to the historical patterns of financial markets, in some cases running back over many decades. To invest intelligently in securities, one should be forearmed with an adequate knowledge of how the various types of bonds and stocks have actually behaved under varying conditions, some of which, at least, one is likely to meet again in one's own experience. No statement is more true and better applicable to Wall Street than the famous warning of Satyana. Those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Our text is directed to investors as distinguished from speculators, and our first task will be to clarify and emphasize this now all but forgotten distinction. We may say at the outset that this is not a how to make a million book. There are no sure and easy paths to riches on Wall Street or anywhere else. It may be well to point up what we have just said by a bit of financial history, especially since there is more than one moral to be drawn from it. In the climactic year 1929, John J. Raskob, the most important figure nationally as well as on Wall Street, extolled the blessings of capitalism in an article in the Ladies' Home Journal entitled, Everybody Ought to Be Rich. His thesis was that savings of only $15 per month invested in good common stocks with dividends reinvested would produce an estate of $80,000 in 20 years against total contributions of only $3,600. If the General Motors tycoon was right, this was indeed a simple road to riches. How nearly right was he? Our rough calculation, based on assumed investment in the 30 stocks making up the Dow Jones Industrial Average, indicates that if Raskow's prescription had been followed during 1929 to 1948, the investor's holdings at the beginning of 1949 would have been worth about $8,500. This is a far cry from the great man's promise of $80,000. And it shows how little reliance can be placed on such optimistic forecasts and assurances. But as an aside, we should remark that the return actually realized by the 20 year operation would have been better than 8% compounded annually. And this despite the fact that the investor would have begun his purchases with the Dow Jones at DJIA at 300 and ended with a valuation based on the 1948 closing level of 177. This record may be regarded as a persuasive argument for the principle of regular monthly purchase of strong common stocks through thick and thin, a program known as dollar cost averaging. Since our book is not addressed to speculators, it is not meant for those who trade in the market. Most of these people are guided by charts or other largely mechanical means of determining the right movements to buy and sell. The one principle that applies to nearly all these so-called technical approaches is that one should buy because a stock or the market has gone up and one should sell because it has declined. This is the exact opposite of sound business sense everywhere else and is most unlikely that it can lead to lasting success on Wall Street. In our own stock market experience and observation extending over 50 years, we have not known a single person who has consistently or lastingly made money by thus following the market. We do not hesitate to declare that this approach is as fallacious as it is popular. We should illustrate what we have just said, though of course this should not be taken as proof by a later brief discussion of the famous Dow theory for trading in the stock market. <clears throat> Since its publication in 1949, revisions of the intelligent investor have appeared at intervals of approximately five years. In updating the current version, we shall have to deal with quite a number of new developments since the 1965 edition was written. These include one, an unprecedented advance in the interest rate on high-grade bonds. Two, a fall of about 35% in the price level of leading common stocks, ending in May 1970. This was the highest percentage decline in some 30 years. Countless issues of lower quality had a much larger shrinkage. Three, a persistent inflation of wholesale and consumers' prices, which gained momentum even in the face of a decline of general business in 1970. Four, the rapid development of conglomerate companies, franchise operations, and other relative novelties in business and finance. These include a number of tricky devices such as letter stock, 
proliferation of stock option warrants, misleading names, use of foreign banks, and others. Five, bankruptcy of our largest railroad, excessive short and long-term debt of many formerly strong entrenched companies, and even a disturbing problem of solvency among Wall Street houses. Six, the advent of the performance vogue in the management of investment funds, including some bank-operated trust funds with disquieting results. These phenomena will have our careful consideration, and some will require changes in conclusions and emphasis from our previous edition. The underlying principles of sound investment should not alter from decade to decade, but the application of these principles must be adapted to significant changes in the financial mechanisms and climate. The last statement was put to the test during the writing of the, night of the present edition, the first draft of which was finished in January 1971. At that time, the DJIA was in a strong recovery from its 1970 low of 632 and was advancing toward a 1970 high of 951 with attendant general optimism. As the last draft was finished in November 1971, the market was in the throes of a new decline, carrying it down to 797 with a renewed general uneasiness about its future. We have not allowed these fluctuations to affect our general attitude towards sound investment policy which remains substantially unchanged since the first edition of this book in 1949. The extent of the market shrinkage in 1969 through 70 should have served to dispel an illusion that had been gaining ground during the past two decades. This was that leading common stocks could be bought at any time and at any price with the assurance not only of ultimate profit but also that any intervening loss would soon be recouped by a renewed advance of the market to new high levels. This was too, that was too good to be true. At long last, the stock market has returned to normal in the sense that both speculators and stock investors must again be prepared to experience significant and perhaps protracted falls as well as rises in the value of their holdings. In the area of many secondary and third line common stocks, especially recently floated enterprises, the havoc wrought by the last market break was catastrophic. This was nothing new in itself. It had happened to a similar degree in 1961 through 62 but there was now a novel element in the fact that some of the investment funds had large commitments in highly speculative and obviously overvalued issues of this type. Evidently, it is not only the Tyro who needs to be warned that while enthusiasm may be necessary for great accomplishments elsewhere, on Wall Street it is almost invariably on Wall Street it almost invariably leads to disaster. The major question we shall have to deal with grows out of the huge rise in the rate of interest on first quality bonds. Since late 1967, the investor has been able to obtain more than twice as much income from such bonds as he could from dividends on representative common stocks. At the beginning of 1972, the return was 7.19% on highest grade bonds versus only 2.76% on industrial stocks. This compares with 4.4% and 2.92% respectively at the end of 1964. It is hard to realize that when we first wrote this book in 1949, the figures were almost the exact opposite. The bonds returned only 2.66% and the stocks yielded 6.82%. In previous editions, we have consistently urged that at least 25% of the conservative investors portfolio be held in common stocks. And we have favored in general a 50-50 division between the two media. We must now consider whether the current ad great advantage of bond yields over stock yields would justify an all-bond policy until a more sensible relationship returns, as we expect it will. Naturally, the question of continued inflation will be of great importance in reaching our decision here. A chapter will be devoted to this discussion. In the past, we have made a basic distinction between two kinds of investors to whom this book was addressed, the defensive and the enterprising. The defensive or passive investor will place his chief emphasis on the avoidance of serious mistakes or losses. His second aim will be freedom from effort, annoyance, and the need for making frequent decisions. The determining, the determining trait of the enterprising or active or aggressive investor is his willingness to devote time and care to the selection of securities that are both sound and more attractive than the average. Over many decades, an enterprising investor of this sort could expect a worthwhile reward for his extra skill and effort in the form of a better average return than that realized by the passive investor. We have some doubt whether a really substantial extra recompense is promised to the active investor under today's conditions, but next year or the years after may well be different. We shall accordingly continue to devote attention to the possibilities for enterprising investment as they existed in former periods and may return. 
It has long been the prevalent view that the art of successful investment lies first in the choice of those industries that are most likely to grow in the future, and then in identifying the most promising companies in these industries. For example, smart investors, or their smart advisors, who long ago have recognized the great growth possibilities of the computer industry as a whole and of international business machines in particular, and similarly for a number of other growth industries and growth companies. But this is not as easy as it always looks in retrospect. To bring this point home at the outset, let us add here a paragraph that we included first in the 1949 edition of this book. Such an investor may, for example, be a buyer of air transport stocks because he believes their future is even more brilliant than the trend the market already reflects. For this class of investor, the value of our book will lie more in its warnings against the pitfalls lurking in this favorable investment approach than in any positive technique that will help him along his path. The pitfalls have proved particularly dangerous in the industry we mentioned. It was, of course, easy to forecast that the volume of air traffic would grow spectacularly over the years. Because of this factor, their shares became a favorite choice of the investment funds. But despite the, but despite the expansion of revenues, at a pace even greater than in the computer industry, a combination of technological problems and overexpansion of capacity made for fluctuating and even disastrous profit figures. In the year 1970, despite a new high in traffic figures, the airline sustained a loss of some $200 million for their shareholders. They had shown losses also in 1945 and 1961. The stocks of these companies once again showed a greater decline in 1967 through 1970 than did the general market. The record shows that even the highly paid full-time experts of the mutual funds were completely wrong about the fairly short-term future of a major and non-esoteric industry. On the other hand, while the investment funds had substantial investments and substantial gains in IBM, the combination of its apparently high price and the impossibility of being certain about its rate of growth prevented them from having more than, say, 3% of their funds in this wonderful performer. Hence, the effect of this excellent choice on their overall results was by no means decisive. Furthermore, many, if not most, of their investments in computer industry companies other than IBM appear to have been unprofitable. From these two broad examples, we draw two morals from our readers. One. Obvious prospects for physical growth in a business do not translate into obvious profits for investors. Two, the experts do not have dependable ways of selecting and concentrating on the most promising companies in the most promising industries. The author did not follow this approach in his financial career as fund manager, and he cannot offer either specific counsel or much encouragement to those who may wish to try it. What then will we aim to accomplish in this book? Our main objective will be to guide the reader against the areas of possible substantial error, error and to develop policies with which he will be comfortable. We shall say quite a bit about the psychology of investors. For indeed, the investor's chief problem, and even his worst enemy, is likely to be himself. The fault, dear investor, is not in our stars, and not in our stocks, but in ourselves. This has proved more the more true over recent decades as it has become more necessary for conservative investors to acquire common stocks and thus to expose themselves willy-nilly to the excitement and the temptations of the stock market. By arguments, examples, and exhortation, we hope to aid our readers to establish the proper mental and emotional attitudes toward their investment decisions. We have seen much more money made and kept by ordinary people who are temperamentally well-suited for the investment process than by those who lack this quality even though they had an, ex an extensive knowledge of finance, accounting, and stock market lore. Additionally, we hope to implant in the reader a tendency to measure or quantify. For 99 issues out of 100, we can say that at some price they are cheap enough to buy, and at some other price they would be so dear that they should be sold. The habit of relating what is paid to what is being offered is an invaluable trait in investment. In an article in a woman's magazine many years ago, we advise the readers to buy their stocks as they bought their groceries, not as they bought their perfume. The really dreadful losses over the past few years, and on many similar occasions before, were realized in those common stock issues where the buyer forgot to ask, how much? In June 1970, the question, how much, could be answered by the magic figure, 9.4%, the yield obtainable on new offerings of high-grade public utility bonds. This has now dropped to about 7.3%, but even that return tempts us to ask, why give any other answer? 
but there are other possible answers and these must be carefully considered. Besides which, we repeat that both we and our readers must be prepared in advance for the possibility, for the possibly quite different considerations of say, 1973 through 1977. We shall therefore present in some detail a positive program for common stock investment, part of which is within the purview of both classes of investors and part is intended mainly for the enterprising group. Strangely enough, we shall suggest as one of our chief requirements here that our readers limit themselves to issues selling not far above their tangible asset value. The reason for this seemingly outmoded counsel is both practical and psychological. Experience has taught us Experience has taught us that, while there are many good growth companies worth several times net assets, the buyer of such shares will be too dependent upon too dependent on the vagaries and fluctuations of the stock market. By contrast, the investor in shares, say of public utility companies at about their net asset value, can always consider himself the owner of an interest in sound and expanding businesses, acquired at a rational price, regardless of what the stock market might say to the contrary. The ultimate result of such concert the ultimate result of such a conservative policy is likely to work out better than exciting adventures into the glamorous and dangerous fields of anticipated growth. The art of investment has one characteristic that is not generally appreciated. A creditable, if unspectacular, result can be achieved by the lay investor with the minimum of effort and capability. But to improve this easily attainable standard requires much application and more than a trace of wisdom. If you merely try to bring just a little extra knowledge and cleverness to bear upon your investment program. Instead of realizing a little better than normal results, you may well find that you have done worse. Since anyone, by just buying and holding a representative list, can equal the performance of the market averages, it would seem a comparatively simple matter to beat the averages. But as a matter of fact, the proportion of smart people who try this and fail is surprisingly large. Even the majority of the investment funds with all their experienced personnel have not performed so well over the years as has the general market. Allied to the foregoing is the record of the published stock market predictions of the brokerage houses, for there is strong evidence that their calculated forecasts have been somewhat less reliable than the simple tossing of a coin. In writing this book, we have tried to keep this basic pitfall of investment in mind. The virtues of a simple portfolio policy have been emphasized. The purchase of high-grade bonds plus a diversified list of leading common stocks, which any investor can carry out with a little expert assistance. The adventure beyond this safe and sound territory has been presented as fraught with challenging difficulties, especially in the area of temperament. Before attempting such a venture, the investor should feel sure of himself and of his advisors, particularly as to whether they have a clear concept of the, difference, the differences between investment and speculation, and between market price and underlying value. A strong-minded approach to investment, firmly based on the margin of safety principle, can yield handsome rewards. But a decision to try for these emol emoluments rather than for the assured fruits of defensive investment should not be made without much self-examination. A final retrospective thought. When the young author entered Wall Street in June 1914, no one had any inkling of what the next half century had in store. The stock market did not even suspect that a world war was to break out in two months and close down the New York Stock Exchange. Now, in 1972, we find ourselves the richest and most powerful country on earth, but beset by all sorts of major problems and more apprehensive than confident of the future. Yet if we confine our attention to American investment experience, there is some comfort to be gleaned from the last 57 years. Through all their vicissitudes and casualties, as earth-shaking as they were unforeseen, it remained true that sound investment principles produced generally sound results. We must act on the assumption that they will continue to do so. Note to the reader. This book does not address itself to the overall financial policy of savers and investors. It was only with that portion of their funds which they are prepared to place in marketable or redeemable securities, that is, in bonds and stocks. Consequently, we do not discuss such important media as savings and time deposits, savings and loan association accounts, life insurance, annuities, and real estate mortgages or equity ownership. The reader should bear in mind that when he finds the word now or the equivalent in the text, it refers to late 1971 or early 1972. Commentary on the introduction. If you have built castles in the air, your work need not be lost. That is where they should be. Now put the foundations under them. Henry David Thoreau, Walden. 
Notice that Graham announces from the start that this book will not teach you how to beat the market. No truthful book can. Indeed, this book will teach you three powerful lessons. How you can minimize the odds of suffering irreversible losses. How you can maximize the chances of achieving sustainable gains. How you can control the self-defeating behavior that keeps most investors from reaching their full potential. Back in the boom years of the late 1990s, when technology stocks seemed to be doubling in value every day, the notion that you could lose almost all your money seemed absurd. By the end of 2002, many of the dot-com and telecom stocks had lost 95% of their value or more. Once you lose 95% of your money, you have to gain 1,900% just to get back to where you started. Taking a foolish risk can put you so deep in the hole that it's virtually impossible to get out. That's why Graham constantly emphasizes the importance of avoiding losses, not just in chapters 6, 14, and 20, but in the threads of warning that he has woven throughout his entire text. But no matter how careful you are, the price of your investments will go down from time to time. While no one can eliminate that risk, Graham will show you how to manage it and how to get your fears under control. Are you an intelligent investor? Now let's answer a vitally important question. What exactly does Graham mean by an intelligent investor? Back in the first edition of this book, Graham defines the term, and he makes it clear that this kind of intelligence has nothing to do with IQ or SAT scores. It simply means being patient, disciplined, and eager to learn. You must also be able to harness your emotions and think for yourself. This kind of intelligence, explains Graham, is a trait more of the character than of the brain. It's a proof that high IQ and higher education are not enough to make an investor intelligent. In 1998, Long-Term Capital Management, LP, a hedge fund run by a battalion of mathematicians, computer scientists, and two Nobel Prize winning economists, lost more than $2 billion in a matter of weeks on a huge bet that the bond market would return to normal. But the bond market kept right on becoming more and more abnormal. And LTCM had borrowed so much money that it's collapsed nearly capsized the global financial system. And back in the spring of 1720, Sir Isaac Newton owned shares in the South Sea Company, the hottest stock in England. Sensing that the market was getting out of hand, the great physicist muttered that he could calculate the motions of the heavenly bodies, but not the madness of the people. Newton dumped his South Sea shares, pocketing a prof uh, pocketing a 100% profit totaling. 7,000 pounds. But just months later, swept up in the wild enthusiasm of the market, Newton jumped back in at a much higher price and lost 20,000 pounds, or more than 3 million in today's money. For the rest of his life, he forbade anyone to speak the words South Sea in his presence. Sir Isaac Newton was one of the most intelligent people who ever lived, as most of us would define intelligence. But in Graham's terms, Newton was far from an intelligent investor. By letting the roar of the crowd override his own judgment, the world's greatest scientist acted like a fool. In short, if you failed at investing so far, it's not because you're stupid. It's because, like Sir Isaac Newton, you haven't developed the emotional discipline that successful investing requires. In Chapter 8, Graham describes, Graham describes how to enhance your intelligence by harnessing your emotions and refusing to stoop to the market's level of irrationality. There you can master his lesson that being an intelligent investor is more a matter of character than brain. The Chronicle of Calamity. Now let's take a moment to look at some of the major financial developments over the of the past few years. One, the worst market crash since the Great Depression, with U.S. stocks losing 50.2% of their value, or $7.4 trillion between March 2000 and October 2002. Far deeper drops in the share prices of the hottest companies of the 1990s, including AOL, Cisco, JDS, Uniphase, Lucent, and Qualcomm, plus the utter destruction of hundreds of internet stocks. Accusations of massive financial fraud at some of the largest and most respected corporations in America, including Enron, Tyco, and Xerox. Four, the bankruptcies of such once glistening companies as Conseco, Global Crossing, and Worldcom. Five, allegations that accounting firms cooked the books and even destroyed records to help their clients mislead the investing public. Six, charges that top executives at leading companies siphoned off hundreds of millions of dollars for their own personal gain. Seven, 
proved that security analysis on Wall Street praised stocks publicly, but admitted privately that they were garbage. Eight, a stock market that, even after its blood-curling decline, seems overvalued by historical measures, suggesting to many experts that stocks have further yet to fall. Nine, a relentless decline in interest rates that has left investors with no attractive alternative to stocks. 10. An investing environment bristling with the unpre unpredictable menace of global terrorism and war in the Middle East. Much of this damage could have been, and was, avoided by investors who learned and lived by Graham's principles. As Graham puts it, while enthusiasm may be necessary for great accomplishments elsewhere, on Wall Street it almost invariably leads to disaster. By letting themselves get carried away on internet stocks, on big growth stocks, on stocks as a whole, Many people made the same stupid mistakes as Sir Isaac Newton. They let other investors' judgments determine their own. They ignored Graham's warning that the really dreadful losses always occur after, after the buyer forgot to ask how much. Most painfully of all, by losing their self-control just when they needed it the most, these people proved Graham's assertion that the investor's chief problem, and even his worst enemy, is likely to be himself. The sure thing that wasn't. Many of those people got especially carried away on technology and internet stocks, believing the high-tech hype that this industry would keep outgrowing every other for years to come, if not forever. In mid-1999, after earning a 117.3% return in just the first five months of the year, Monument Internet Fund portfolio manager Alexander Chin predicted that his fund would gain 50% a year over the next three to five years and an annual average of 35% over the next 20 years. After his Amerindo Technology Fund rose an incredible 248.9% in 1999, portfolio manager Alberto Villar ridiculed anyone who dared to doubt that the internet was a perpetual money-making machine. If you're out of this sector, you're going to underperform. You're in a horse and buggy and I'm in a Porsche. You don't like tenfold growth opportunities? and go with someone else. In February 2000, hedge fund manager James J. Kramer proclaimed that internet-related companies are the only ones worth owning right now. These winners of the new world, as he called them, are the only ones that are going higher consistently in good days and bad. Kramer even took a pot shot at Graham. You have to throw out all of the matrices and formulas and texts that have existed before the web. If we used any of what Graham and Dodd teach us, we wouldn't have a dime under management. All these so-called experts ignore Graham's sober words of warning. Obvious prospects for physical growth in a business do not translate into obvious profits for investors. While it seems easy to foresee which industry will grow the fastest, that foresight has no real value if most other investors are already expecting the same thing. By the time everyone decides that a given industry is obviously the best one to invest in, the prices of its stocks have been bid up so high that its future returns have nowhere to go but down. For now, at least, no one has the gall to try claiming that technology will still be the world's greatest growth industry. But make sure you remember this. The people who now claim that the next sure thing will be healthcare or energy or real estate or gold are no more likely to be in the right than the hypesters of high tech turned out to be. The silver lining. If no price seemed too high for stocks in the 1990s, in 2003, we've reached a point at which no price appears to be low enough. The pendulum has swung, as Graham knew it always does, from irrational exuberance to unjustifiable pessimism. In 2002, investors drank $27 billion out of stock mutual funds, and a survey conducted by the Securities Industry Association found that one out of 10 investors had cut back on stocks by at least 25%. The same people who were eager to buy stocks in the late 1990s, when they were going up in price and therefore becoming expensive, sold stocks as they went down in price and by definition becoming cheaper. As Graham shows so brilliantly in chapter eight, this is exactly backwards. The intelligent investor realizes that stocks become more risky, not less, as their prices rise, and less risky, not more, as their prices fall. The intelligent investor dreads a bull market since it makes stocks more costly to buy. And conversely, so long as you keep enough cash on hand to meet your spending needs, you should welcome a bear market since it puts stocks back on sale. So take heart. The depth of the bull market is not the bad news everyone believes it to be. Thanks to the decline in stock prices, 
now in a considerably safer and saner time to be building wealth. Now is considerably a safer and saner time to be building wealth. Read on and let Graham show you how.